So next up in our final presentation, it's going to be a little longer, is uh, Jean from uh, Fond du Lac, right? Yeah. <laughs> Jean has a master's degree from the University of Wisconsin-Stevens Point, where he majored in natural resources with an emphasis in geographic information systems. In his career, he has provided GIS support for several organizations, including the Army Corps of Engineers, Army Geospatial Center, Federal Emergency Management Agency, and the Rails to Trails Conservation Conservancy in Washington, D.C. He has traveled to many Army bases across the U.S. for airborne sensing, sensory testing, has deployed to Iraq, and has spent time in Rwanda performing airborne data collections. He is currently the GIS coordinator in his hometown of Fond du Lac, and he's going to take us under the hood of Pipe Tech. Thanks, David. So how many people here uh, televise their sanitary sewers? Uh, a few. How many people are using Pipe Tech? Okay, so how many people that are using Pipe Tech are happy with Pipe Tech? I don't see any hands. Oh, I see half a hand. Okay. There's a mic here somewhere. All right, that better? Cool. Anybody using other software other than PyTech? Yeah, what, what are you using? Awesome. Okay, I'm not sure I've heard of that one. So anyway, today I'm gonna to talk about uh, how we use uh, PipeTech for, for automation. And this is a picture of our, our sewer rat on our TV truck, uh, which we are soon replacing. Um, kind of expensive. So we've automated pretty much everything from copying the inspection data from the truck to the server. We, we transcode our MPEG-2 videos to MPEG-4 using X.264 compression. Um, we import the inspection data into the PipeTech library. We export the PipeTech library. This is all automated. And we add and modify fields to those exported tables, getting it ready for ingestion into SDE. We perform distance corrections for uh, linear referencing, because sometimes the, the line segment in your GIS from manhole one to manhole two might not be the same length that you actually televise in the field. We, uh, we update our feature class data using that tabular data from the inspection. We add attachments to the feature class, and we also clean our, our staging folder that, that PipeTech uses. And the last step is copying the new data to the truck uh, the next day. So we're doing this automation process every single night. So I don't, I don't know too much about the hardware on the truck, but I know that we have a couple of Q's cameras and uh, a mix of uh, Aries components. I know they don't necessarily play well together. But um, we also have a Windows 7 PC. We have dual monitors. We have a wireless card in the computer so we can pull the data from the truck every night. Um, and most importantly, they have a microwave. <laughs> so this is kind of what the command center looks like, if you want to call it that. In the truck, we have, uh, we have dual monitors, top and bottom. That was kind of the only way they could mount them because originally they just had one monitor and decided to add this one on for the GIS integration that PipeTech offers. Um, here's our rack system for the computer. It's a 4U unit. Up here we have an air conditioner and a microwave and a battery backup and, and the control system for the camera. So a little bit about the city of Fond du Lac. We have an ELA, and that was mentioned a little bit earlier. It's pretty cool. We can install ArcGIS Advanced on as many computers as we want across the city. We have an ArcGIS Online subscription with something like 16,000 credits. Um, we have ArcGIS for server. We have Portal. We have the web adapter. We are using Collector for ArcGIS, not necessarily for televising, but for other applications. And we mainly use Android tablets. And anybody here use Android versus iOS? Okay. If you go that route, I would kind of recommend a Nexus tablet. It's pretty cool um, from Google. Um, so what tools are we using to accomplish all this automation? We're using a good old-fashioned batch files. Uh, we're using a program called Handbrake, if anybody's familiar with that. Anybody? Okay. Anybody who's like ripping their DVDs and making backups and things like that. 
Um, we use a program called Auto Hotkey, which has been around for, for a long time. Uh, we're also using Access and Visual Basic for applications, as well as Python scripting. And the thing that brings them all together is Windows Task Scheduler. So this is kind of our, our timetable here. We, the first thing we do is we copy data to the truck in the morning, okay, from our SDE databases. We do the televising. Um, we do this process of deleting locks on the truck before we copy it to the server because lock files get generated and somehow we, you get remnant files and those can affect the uh, automation process because they put a lock on the database. Um, we then, after we copy the data to the server, we transcode our videos using Handbrake. And that we, makes them smaller? Yeah, I'll get into that. But we're looking at about 70% 70 70 reduction in file size. It's clear? Yes. Um, so we're using a program called AutoHotKey for the library agent and pipe tech export. We're doing some bridge processing in Microsoft Access using VBA or Visual Basic for Applications. We are then importing that data into SDE. Um, I believe that's using Python, but we'll get into that. And feature class population using Python, as well as attaching PDFs to the database. And then we, we clear out our, our staging folder that, uh, that we use for Pipe Tech and the library agent. So every morning, the old GIS data on the truck is deleted. We copy new data to the truck because every night we are running these enterprise scripts which reconcile and post everything from our child versions up to our parent version. And we push new data to the truck every, every night, every morning. Uh, we don't do anything with the imagery because that really doesn't change. And um, actually we're doing two things. We're pulling the data to the truck and we're pushing the data to the truck as a backup because sometimes our scripts don't always work. There might be a break in the Wi-Fi connection. We've gotten several calls this summer about the data not opening in Pipe Tech Map, and we found out that for whatever reason the data didn't copy over. So we kind of made a plan B process, and we're running actually a separate process to push the data to the truck as well. And so down below is kind of grayed out, but it's a kind of an example of the batch file. So basically, you know, if we look for the data on the truck, and if it exists, then we delete it, and then we just do an X copy to the truck again. And this, kind of, this script is kind of written so that you can specify any computer on your network and push over the data that way by using a variable. So the other thing we do, I mentioned these lock files, and they are LDB files. And does anybody recognize that file extension? It's actually a Microsoft Access lock file. So your, your Pipe Tech database is really a Microsoft Access database. It's not necessarily proprietary, but it is password protected, so nobody can get into it. So we, we delete these files because if you have a lock file on the database, it's hard to open in any other program, uh, especially the library agent for importing into your uh, Pipe Tech library. So this is kind of an example of what that script looks like. So it just deletes the files. Um, in each of, the, each of the folders in our inspection folder on the truck. So we have sort of a, a naming convention for our inspections, and, and basically this is it. We prefix it with a, a date, and then our asset ID or pipe ID, whatever you want to call it. This is kind of an example of what that looks like. So we kind of we start big and we work small, and so we start with the year, the month, the day, and then the asset ID. And this comes in extremely handy. This is very important later on for all of your scripts that you're writing. Uh, we also write a, a text file to the folder as sort of a flag to notify <laughs> us later on in our scripts that the file was actually, or the files were actually copied over. We also use, there's, I'll show this a little bit later, but we also use a, a staging folder for uh, pipe tech library agent. There's kind of two different ways you can do it if you're familiar with Pipe Tech, but I'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, we uh, separate our sanitary and storm inspections into separate archive folders. We don't uh, really care too much about storm at this point. We're really concerned about sanitary. 
So this is uh, more of a future development thing for us. One thing I do want to note is that we do keep our truck, plug, our truck plugged in at the end of every day, so it's powered up pretty much 24 or 7 whenever they're not in the field. And this allows us to run these scripts overnight. And the computer is turned on. So for those familiar with Handbrake, um, it's pretty much a tool for converting video from nearly any format to nearly any other format. And it allows you to really compress your videos while maintaining the quality of the video. There is a, a program called Handbrake CLI, which is basically a command line interface. And you can write a script to basically batch process all of your videos. And because pipe tech, it seemed like several years ago you had to have a pipe tech viewer uh, to view the pipe tech stuff. It wasn't like you could just see an MPG on a Windows, whatever. Is, did, did that, was that necessary in order to have the pipe tech video convert to something that anything could read? No, you can, you can open up the videos like in uh, Windows Media Player. Yeah, it's okay. a PTV no. file. Huh? It's a PTV file extension. But it's really just an MPEG-2 file. Yeah, so you don't need pipe tech uh, view or anything like that to watch the video. So this is kind of a, an example of what that script looks like. We're just going to iterate through our, our staging folder. We're going to look for these PTV files. And this is the handbrake uh, syntax. So we're basically going to take that file name. We're going to give it the MP4 extension. We're going to encode it to x.264. This is our quality and our bit rate. And then when we're done, we're going to delete the original file. And it's safe for us to do this because we still have all of our videos on the truck. So there is a backup. So for example, for 2015, we had 185 sanitary inspections. The PTV file size for all of those inspections was nearly 60 gig. After doing the MP4 conversion, we got it down to about 12 gig, which is about 70%. And if you guys want to learn more, want to learn more about uh, how that command line interface works and all the syntax and, and switches and so forth, this is the website where you can get that information. So this is kind of the timeline of our, of our Windows task scheduler. So the first thing, we've kind of covered the first, uh, first five topics here. The next two topics are going to be the library agent and the pipe tech export. And for that, we are going to use a program called AutoHotKey. And you guys can read that, but originally AutoHotKey started out as programming your keyboard hotkeys to launch certain applications. But now it's kind of evolved into a full scripting language, which is pretty neat. So we can write a script, and this is just a text space. You can do this in any you know, notepad or text editor. We're going to call a program. Here it's the pipe tech library agent with the run command. We're going to let it sleep for, this is actually 20 seconds and some milliseconds. Allow it to open because sometimes you might have a lot of inspections in your staging folder and it could take a while to read through all those folders. So after we do that, we're going to send a control click and we're going to send that to a button named transfer all new inspections, which is this button down here. And for the window pipe tech library agent, which is the title right here. And then we're going to sleep again for two minutes as it populates all of these inspections into our library. And then when we're, we're done with that, we're going to just close the window. So we, we call this script. It's associated with the, the uh, auto hotkey program. We're going to call it using Windows Task Scheduler. And we do that every afternoon. So some important things to think about if you're using pipe tech is that you need to set up certain things in the pipe tech library agent options. First of all, you don't want to automatically delete your inspections after they're added to the library. We're going to do that programmatically later using Python. And you want to set this right here to do a transfer and add versus do not transfer and add. And really what this transfer and add means is that it's going to copy it to your archive folder or your permanent, your permanent folder rather than uh, moving those files. 
And we also want to make sure that auto find is checked here so that when the library agent opens, it's going to look for all the new inspections automatically without you having to click a button. So this is the uh, auto hotkey script that we wrote for actually exporting the, uh, the library from, from the PipeTech view program. So basically, we are going to launch, tech pipe te launch pipe tech view. We're going to wait 60 seconds. And then we're going to basically have the program click on the file menu, go down to export, select inspection information, and then select access database file. So it's going to do this without any user interaction whatsoever. So we're telling it which control to go to, into, in the software, and we're telling it exactly what to do. So after we do that, we're going we're to sleep for another 10 seconds, and then we're going to send these keystrokes to the program. And what this is basically entering is the file name and the path to the file that you want to export. And then we're going to sleep again. We're going to hit the Enter button. And then we're going to sleep again for, for basically 90 seconds, waiting for that export to occur. Okay, And essentially what we're doing is we're exporting. This isn't a proprietary database, but it's a password-protected database. So we have to export it to a format that we can read, which is Microsoft Access. And I do kind of have a demo of how that works, if the demo, video demo works. So there's really, there's really no user interaction here whatsoever. This is just running in task scheduler. It's launching pipe tech. It's uh, waiting for a few seconds, and then it's going to send a control A to select all the inspections. And then it's going to go to the file menu and then export. And right here, you'll, you'll see that it's going to start typing in the path and the file name. And then it's going to send a click to say, yes, I want to overwrite the existing database. And if you look right down here, you can see, if you can read it in the back, probably not, a, a temp database that's being created as this existing one is being overwritten. And up here, we have task scheduler. So here is the task that is executed around 5, five o'clock every single day. And apparently, I need to update my antivirus software. <laughs> So that's it. There's, there's, no, there's no typing. There's no clicking. We just execute task scheduler, and it does all this for us. So getting back to our timeline here, we're, we have to now do some bridge processing of that exported database so we can bring it into SDE. And the way we do that is with uh, VBA with Microsoft Access. So we basically, we're only just importing two tables into essentially a new database that we're going to use for some processing. So we essentially, we, we establish a link to the feature class that we have in SDE. And we can do that through an ODBC connection in Microsoft Access. And I'll go through that in a little bit. Uh, we create some queries. We write a, a function to make some changes to, to fields and so forth. Um, there is an auto exec macro that we can basically write and access that says, together with this run code macro, that we basically say when we launch this database, we want it to execute this code and then close the database right away. So there's no user interaction. We can run this from task scheduler. It recognizes that it needs to run code as soon as the database opens. And then once it com completes that code, it closes the database. So in Access, we go to external data. And we say an Access database. And we go to our PipeTech export that we exported from PipeTech, right? We're going to import some tables into this database, which is our processing database. And these are the two tables, our observations and our inspections. And here it is in Access. We can see that two tables were added, observations and inspections. And now we're going to connect again to SDE via a ODBC connection. And here we're not importing data. We're actually linking to the data in, in SQL Server. 
because we're not going to make any modifications to it. We just want to pull some information from it. The name of our database happens to be prod. And the way you kind of set up this list is that you go into new and you specify your SQL Server instance. You put in your credentials. You specify the database that you want. And it creates this connection for you. And the, day, the table that we're actually interested in is our sanitary mains. And we are using a versioned uh, SDE database. So it's suffix with this VW prefix, which I believe means versioned workspace. And that's the table that we want. So this is the attribute table for our sanitary mains in SDE. We have to specify a, uh, basically a, a unique identifier field, which we can just use object ID for. And so now we not only have observations and inspections, but we have our attribute table for our sanitary mains. So now we can write an update query in Access. Anybody use Access before and write queries and things like that? Yeah, I figured you did, Dave. Long time ago. So like Dave was talking about, you can set up relationships between your tables. Here we have our sanitary main attribute table and our inspections table, and we're going to relate it by, by asset ID or the ID of the pipe. And I don't re really remember what this query does. It has something to do with the status of the pipe. So we can write another query. Um, we're looking at inspections again and observations, and we're going to relate it based on our ID of the pipe inspection. And here we're doing a, different, a few different things. We are, we are populating asset ID into our observations table, because our observations table doesn't have asset ID. Only in the inspection table does. And we are also populating uh, the length of the, of the TV inspection into our observations table. Because our observation table really only has distances. It doesn't have the total length of the pipe. OK, so here's a, another query. <coughs> that observations table that we just put those fields into, we're going to take a closer look at uh, the distances and the lengths. And we're going to establish a distance correction because, like I said, manhole to manhole in GIS, let's say that's 100 feet. Well, let's say when you televise it, it's only 99 feet. OK? Or maybe it's 101 feet or something different. But when you do your linear referencing, you have to make sure that your distance, distances are corrected and will fit in that line that you have in GIS. So the kind of the way you do that is you set up a ratio. So if, you're, if your first observation is at 10 feet and your pipe is 100 feet long, according to your inspection, but in GIS, it's 99 feet long. So that would be 10 over 100 equals basically x over 99. And you can figure out what your correction is, and you can kind of prorate it. And here's kind of what that looks like. So here's our, here's our observations table, and here is the length of the inspection. Here are the distances. But here is the length that we have in GIS. So the length that we inspected was 344.3 feet. What we have in GIS is 341.21 feet. So the distance correction, you, you would think, would be a little bit less than 13.2. But for whatever reason, the way that linear referencing works in ArcGIS, we had to invert it. So we had to take the total length and subtract whatever that correction was to get what we have here is 328. So it's not quite 13.2, but it's the, it's the prorated amount. So some of the, and I won't get too much into this, but some of the VBA that we do is that we, we import, you know, when this database is opened, we're going to run these scripts automatically. We're going to import our inspection and observations table into this database. And then we're going to copy yeah, we're going to copy those tables into this database, and then we're going to alter some of the fields. So as it turns out, Microsoft Access has field formats that ArcGIS doesn't like. There's a memo field format, and I believe there's an auto number field format. And there's no such fields like those in ArcGIS. So we have to alter those fields to something that ArcGIS will, will basically ingest. 
So a memo field can be a text field, but it can only be up to 254 or 55 characters. A uh, auto number field can be basically a, an integer field. We're also going to add some fields for, for linear referencing. So if these, uh, what I showed you before, there was an asset ID field and a TV length and a status field. If those fields don't exist, we're going to add those into the table before we can run those queries. And finally, we're going to run the queries. So the status query, the asset ID query, and the query for the observations table. So remember, that and the last thing that we're going to do down here is we're going to close access. So the way it works, task scheduler call, calls this MDB file, this access database. And then as soon as it opens, it's going to run all of these scripts. And it's going to modify the fields. It's going to populate the fields with data. And then it's going to close access. And all this occurs within 30 seconds. So it's pretty fast. Of course, that will depend on the size of your, your library. We have two or 3,000 inspections in ours. So the bigger it is, the longer it's going to take. And this is prepping all the data so that we can bring it into SDE. which now we're down at the SDE import part of our process. So the first thing you have to do in, in our catalog is you have to add an ODC database connection. Has anybody done that before? Well, there's not really a tool for it. You can't really click on a button. You can't select it from the menu system. You have to actually go into customize and do a search on OLE or OLE, however you want to pronounce it, and that up comes a button that you can add to your toolbar. Okay? So then you add it to your toolbar, and then you launch it, and then you get this dialog. And here you can say, well, I want to create a database connection to Microsoft Access. Okay? You click Next. You spe specify the path to your database, the one that we were just working on for that bridge processing. You can run a, a test connection, make sure it works. And then you get this, which is absolutely nothing. <laughs> right? It, where, where did it go? It took me a while to figure this out. So what it does, it actually puts that database connection in your profile folder. So users, your username, app data, roaming, Esri, desktop, our catalog. It creates this ODC connection file. What I would recommend is copying and pasting that someplace where it's more useful. So now, in Python, you can set up a variable to connect to that ODC file, right? Which is your access database. And however you want to do it in Python, basically, I think what I did was a table to cable conversion. But you can do, basically, you could do a truncate and append or whatever function you want to use in Python to get that data from your observations table and your inspections table from Microsoft Access into SDE or your file geodatabase or whatever you're working with. And this is what it looks like. So this is our, our production SDE database. We have an inspections table here and an observations table here. Uh, here we have our distances and our distance corrections, our asset IDs. Not all of the data that we really care about, our observations and our inspections are in SDE. So the next step is to take that data, whatever data we're interested in, and populate that into our feature class. And really, the data that, that we're interested in, the fields that we have in our sanitary mains feature class, that's uh, basically the page number, because we print out a report for every inspection. So we want to know the page number of that report. We want to know when it was TV. We want to know if there were any notes. We especially want to know the pipe rating. One of the things that we do is we treat our inspections as being a field verify of our data. So if there's a difference in pipe material or pipe diameter, we will update that data in our GIS with the field collected data. We also collect on street, upstream street, downstream street, and the inspection folder name, which is pretty important. 
So the next thing we do is we attach the report PDF file to our sanitary main feature class. And I actually didn't write the script, Chad did. Um, so we list, list all of our folders in our staging folder. We determine the asset ID from the inspection folder name. Remember the year, month, day, underscore asset ID. By the way, our folder name is the exact same as all of our file names within the folder. So the report file is going to be the same format. The video file is going to be the same format. And pipe tech inspection database will be the same file format and naming convention, as well as the folder. We also write a text file to that inspection folder telling us that it's, it's basically a flag. It tells us that the report was actually attached to the feature in GIS. So you remember I mentioned earlier that you want to make sure that you uncheck this in the library agent. You know, you set it up to use a staging folder. This is our staging folder right here. So we have all of our inspections listed under the staging folder. We're going to use Python actually to delete all of the inspections in the staging folder. Provided that those text files, those flags that we wrote into, into those folders are there. So we want to make sure that we did attach the PDF and we did populate the feature class with the data before we delete the inspections. And what PipeTech library agent did previously is it already copied the inspections to our, our archive folder, which is the sanitary, sanitary folder here. So we don't really have to keep them in our staging anymore. But the important thing to remember is that we're using Python to manage that. We're not using the library agent. So this is kind of what it looks like in Task Scheduler. We will uh, delete our locks, first of all, on the truck and also on the server if there are any. We will copy the inspections from the truck to our server. We will run the library agent to get all those new inspections into our library. We will run PipeTech export, remember using AutoHotKey, which will export that password protected database into a non-password protected database, uh, Microsoft Access. We will do the bridge processing to alter the fields and create new fields and populate data from one table into another based on various joins. We will then populate those tables into SDE using Python. We will also use Python to populate the feature class with the data from those inspection tables. We will attach the pipe inspections, the PDF report files to our, our feature class. And then we delete the data from our staging directory, providing that those text file flags are present. And then, yeah, that's pretty much it. This last one just basically copies data to the, to the truck from the server. This all kind of goes hand in hand with our nightly uh, enterprise GIS scripts. So every night we disconnect the users, we, we archive some of our data, we do a reconcile and post, we compress, we analyze, we rebuild, we compress again. We sync, uh, we have a production database and our distribution database, we, which is replicated. We, we sync that every single night. Uh, we export our data from SDE to uh, file databases for mobile users, people basically that have laptops that are using ArcMap that want to take their laptop home or want to take it out in the field. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So I know this is fairly technical. Hopefully you guys got a little bit out of it. But do you have any questions? So, so looking at this it seems crazy and it makes me feel good that I'm not miserable GIS. Have you looked at other pipe inspection systems that integrate better with the current GIS system out there? Or is Pipe Tech thinking about doing that? I have put in requests for it. <laughs> right. Uh, every year they tell me, you know, stop reminding me every year. They haven't gotten around to it. I think I think pipe tech is more geared towards the contractor versus the municipality, which you know we are not obviously. And I think I did mention that we are looking at purchasing a new truck and new equipment and potentially new software. That's kind of undetermined whether or not it's going to be pipe tech or something else. So if that answers your question, well, there are other ones out there that seem to integrate more with the municipal level GIS systems than. 
basically the level of integration that Pipe Tech has with GIS is on the truck. So you select your, your pipe on the map and you click a button and it pushes that attribute data into your inspection. All right, so if you have like an on-street and you have pipe material and you have pipe diameter and, and things like that, all populated in GIS, when you click that button, it pushes it over to the inspection. So you don't have to type it in. That's the extent of pipe tech's integration. It's an add-on. It's an add-on and you have to pay for it. And it's, it's, um, it's a, kind of like an ArcMap light, if you could call it that. It does many things, like for viewing, it won't do any editing at whatsoever. But it's, it's kind of like a, it's a runtime, basically, interface of, of ArcMap. I'm, I've been very impressed, but how do you keep that running with all different, if you upgrade a PC, upgrade a software, a piece of software, upgrade, versions of ArcGIS, Windows, all those are potential failure points. How do you manage? Or is it not as bad as it's? It's not that bad. No, not, not at all. And our end users don't really have pipe tech on their systems. They don't need it. Right. Because we can, we can map out the fact that it was inspected. We can map out you know, the rating, you know, give it a color red for a poor rating and green for good. We can map out all of our observations. We know what the observations are. We really just need Esri products you for. Really just need the, but yeah. you just need the, two, the truck and your environment to stay the same, and you can control. Yeah, and the truck problem. doesn't get updated very frequently. Right. <laughs> yeah. On uh, the PipeTech library agent, is that only necessary that add on, on the scan version that's in the televising unit itself? Or does that have to be across the board every? You you, pre, you pretty much need to have it, and I think it's I think it's kind of bundled with Pipe Tech, okay. because what that does it adds the inspections to your library, and remember that library is password protected, so you can't do it any other way. So you definitely need the library agent. What base programs do you licenses does the city have? For for Pipe Tech? Yes. Um, well, there's Pipe Tech Scan, which is on the truck. There's Pipe Tech View, which you can put on your computer in the office, which really you only need one license of it, so you can export the library into a more <coughs> ingestible format. And that's it, I think. Is that what Fondelec has, is one scan and one Pipe Tech View? We have, we have a few licenses. They're floating licenses of View. So you could have it on multiple computers, but only like you know two people can use it at a time. Does it require a PACP template? No, we don't use we don't use PACP. We have our own template. Customize it yourselves, or no? Oh. <laughs> so Unfortunately, I ask that actually is so. Is it their own format that that they use, or is it? It's it's again the template is an access database and it's password protected. So whenever you want a template change, you have to put in a, a request to get a change. And they only allow you to do so many per year. All right. Uh, we'll kind of wrap it up here. Thank you. Yeah.